Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of the season of Doc and Caveman. It has been a while, but I am Dr. Fantasy here with the Fantasy Caveman, as always. And Caveman, what's been new? What's up? Uh, not much, man. We just get, we're excited to get back into the get back into this. We kind of had a long layoff, no explanation. You know, it's kind of uh. There's no, I don't know, I don't know what happened here, but uh, we're back at, we're going to be back at it. Hopefully we'll be, uh, should we be doing this, you know, we're, what are we going to do this twice a week is, I think is the point, the two episodes initially and then once a week. And I'm just excited to see where this, uh, where this show takes us, you know, it's kind of excited to get to it. My theory is that you were off celebrating Damian Lillard all off season, and I was too busy celebrating Wemby going to the Spurs, so we didn't have time to talk about anything else. So we Ooh. actually had. It's been a while since the Spurs had anything to care about, and they still suck. But at least there's something to watch now, which I got to there watch. There's something to watch, yeah. Wemby here in Indiana once, and I think that was his worst game of the season because I put too much pressure on him. But that's okay. Um, he knew you were there, so he felt the pressure, you know? Yeah, I did. I mean, I was cheering for him the whole time, it's, so. It's, it's kind of like Jordan Poole this season. He's really feeling, because all the baddies keep showing up to the, Wizard, oh. the Wizards games, and Jordan Poole's just been, he's just, he's disappointing the baddies, you know? You would think that their attendance would have to be through the roof for that. <laughs> like, why are all these non-basketball fans here? I don't get it, but, um, so... Before we get into it, I think it's kind of funny when you sent me the list of things that you wanted to talk about. And if you listened for even five seconds of anything we posted in previous years, uh, we talk way too much about the Warriors, much to my disgust. And what's the first thing you post that you wanted to talk about? <laughs> Draymond Green. I'm like, you know what? This is a good thing because I don't want to talk about him for more than two minutes. I, and it'll be more than two minutes probably, but so we're going to talk about him and get him yeah. out of the way. And as we're recording <laughs> this today, he was reinstated and there's been some news coming out about him potentially retiring and talking to Adam Silver. So you as the resident warriors fanboy, but not really a fan, but I, yeah. I don't really know what to call it, but what do you think about the, the Draymond situation? <laughs> oh, well, I think, Man, it's uh, it's gotten pretty tough to uh defend Draymond, uh, especially this season. You know, you got just you know he between choking out Gobert. You know, as much as as much as people might hate Gobert, he's got a chokeable face though. To be fair, he's got a chokeable <laughs> face. You know, there's a bunch of stuff. You know, you know about. Back in 2019, we all know about what happened. What happened there? So, Gobert's been a hateable guy, but like I don't think that war. I don't think that warranted choking him out on the court. Uh, then you have, then you have the thing with Nurkic, and it's just I think this is it right here. This is Draymond. If Draymond. I mean, we feel like we've been saying this like the past three or four times he's been suspended. Like, this is his last chance, you know, blah, 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 and then he just keeps uh, coming back. But I think this is it uh, in terms of, like, if he, you know, supposedly he's been going through counseling, he's going to keep going through counseling as the season uh, continues and he's playing. So, I mean... This is Draymond's chance to show, to like, show me appreciation for just defending him all the time. All I do is defend the Warriors, defend Draymond. It's time for him to, it's time for him to show, to show up. And it's time for Draymond to remind, remind people why uh, he's a perennial defensive player of the year candidate, uh, why he's been such an integral part of the Warriors uh, dynasty. Is that coming to an end? Sure, we'll talk about that more every week. It's already but, ended, uh, but... Um. <laughs> but yeah, I just... Yeah, I mean, 
I want to hear what you have to say, but I just think it's time for him to show. That's what I gotta say. It's time for him to now show why, you know, why he's Draymond. Why he's the basketball on the court. What Draymond can do. It's time for him to prove that. Put all the other stuff to the side. Yeah, I think it's a fair point to make that this is the fifth final straw for Draymond. And this is what I've realized from all of this, is that the Warriors are absolutely nothing without Draymond Green, first of all. Mm -hmm. And second of all, don't change. I don't want him to change. I hope he chokes more people (laughs) when he comes back. And the reason for it is because I think the Warriors play like a bunch of losers without that energy and attitude. If And if you look at historically when Draymond's been injured, and he's had his fair share of injury concerns and being out in the past, but when he's not on the floor, this is just not the same team. And the Warriors are an embarrassment. Not an embarrassment right now, but I guess, no, you know what? They're an embarrassment right now. I'm They're the 11th seed in the Western Conference <laughs> right Yeah, now. that's not – in. We're trying to give playoff spots to everybody now with the top 10 making it. So if you're out of it at this point, that's embarrassing. So, but I mean, I, I truly kind of mean that when you look at the record, it's not a huge difference because he wasn't playing super well this year. they are seven and seven with him, uh, 10 and 12 without him. So they've been just kind of bad all around. But when you look at it historically, this team is nothing without him. And I think they need that energy and passion. And I think especially when after you've won that many championships, sometimes you lose that will and desire. Because what are you playing for at this point? Mm -hmm. Another championship isn't going to add anything to Steph Curry's legacy or Clay's or Draymond. Like, they're all going to be Hall of Fame caliber players. I mean, some of the younger guys, obviously, you can argue they have more to play for. But the core of what the Warriors have built this team around, what do they have to be motivated by? So I like the passion. I like the energy. And I would say I've never actually respected Draymond more until he lost his mind again. So I, uh, I'm i going to defend Draymond now. You have given up on him, and I'm telling him, don't change. If Rudy Gobert <laughs> looks at you with his French face, you choke him out. See, that's, that's a reality here. So, uh, yeah, that's that's the Draymond situation. Uh, and then one thing I want you you talk you were you made a couple of good points. You made I like the point you made about uh the desire and you know what le- what does you know Draymond have left to prove for that matter what do Clay and Steph and Steve Kerr for that matter have to to prove they've done everything. But the, and that's the point is. And we haven't talked about it yet, but we talked about it a touch before we started. When Draymond talked to Adam Silver, Draymond told Adam Silver he wanted to retire. And I think that hit kind of hits on your point of the bigger picture. Is the desire for Draymond still there? You know? And I think that's a valid point, too, that we have to pay attention to because if the if this desire is there for Draymond to win and help this team, then I believe he's going to be good uh, going forward. But if we see another incident, we kind that kind of you know shows that he doesn't really care about basketball anymore. So we got to see. Oh, I think it's quite the opposite, actually. If he tones down his emotion, that's who he is at this point. This is what Warriors fan, NBA fans, anybody out there. He's 33 years old, I believe. He's mm-hmm. not changing at this point. If you think he's going to come back and be toned down and not stomp on people's faces, you are sorely mistaken. I mean, so. I mean, th- I mean, you I mean, you don't have to choke someone out on the. <laughs> I mean, I, so, you know, but there's there. You don't want to take away his aggression. You don't want to take away his emotion that he plays with because that's part of what makes Draymond Draymond and what's been part of the success for the Warriors. But it's the that extra, you know, the choking people out, stomping on the chest. This is this is some UFC WWE type stuff that he's been doing in the NBA, which has been very geared towards you know protecting play players, much like the NFL has. So, so you what you're not, saying is leave that stuff for off the court. Got it. <laughs> I mean, what what you do off the court, you do off the court. You know, if we want. I would love the final point we'll make about Draymond. I would love when Draymond's playing career is over to see him appear like in the WWE. 
I think that would be hilarious. <laughs> Uh, he's well on his way. Um, <laughs> all right, let's go to the next thing. I'm excited to talk a little bit about this because it gave me life in the middle of the NBA season, but that's the in-season tournament. So the Lakers were the inaugural winners of that brightly colored. I don't know what that court was, but I liked it. Uh, but the war, the Lakers were the first winners of the in-season tournament. They, um, beat the Pacers in the final, which was kind of interesting. Tyrese Halliburton went on a strong run and the Pacers got super hot and made their way to the finals. But what did you think of that tournament? Did you enjoy it? Did you tune in at all for it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I watched I watched some here and there. I mean, uh, first off, I think it's kind of funny that uh, the Lakers are handing a banner. Like they oh, they should be. Yeah. <laughs> I mean... Well, that's that's just kind of funny. I don't really necessarily knock them. I just think it's kind of funny. But I think the biggest takeaway from uh, this tournament is that you got a way for the players to care at this point during the season. Because at this point during the season, in the past, players don't really care. You got you got all the rest days. You got people. Just, you know, not showing up, like not giving 100%. But you can tell during this tournament, for the most part, you got LeBron James at damn near 40 years old taking charges in the second quarter in the tournament. Like, uh, you got Tyrese Halliburton, which this no this season helped, in-season tournament helped nobody like it helped Tyrese Halliburton. Mm-hmm. This this got like we're talk we're now we're talking. I mean, I kind of already knew. Uh, I love Tyrese Hall- Halliburton coming out of the draft. I th- thought he was a steal of the draft where the Kings got him. You know, that's a subject for another day. The Kings are not. I don't know. I didn't like that trade at all. But uh, but yeah, Halliburton's arrived. If he if you don't think he arrived already. Uh, we're not going to talk about the fact that he just the, the Bucks can't beat the Pacers. I don't know what's up with that. Oh, we should talk uh, about that. Now. I mean, the, they beat they beat the they beat the Bucks in route to make into the finals of the tournament, and so much so that uh, after that loss, I remember Bobby Portis calling out the entire team, uh, telling them to play harder, basically, which I'm fine with, but. Yeah, overall, turning with him is success. You got to remember, money talks. And I think it's like, what, like 500 grand a piece for the winner, each player or something like that. I'm not sure the exact number. But you got to think, for those players making like league minimum or barely league minimum, that's almost five times their salary for the entire year. (laughs) So you got to think of it that way. Like, I think this is a success overall. I mean, I, and I like, I'm, this is a good idea and I'm excited to see this going forward. Yeah. And I think even more importantly, it was very obvious, especially watching that championship game. I mean, it looked like you're watching an NBA finals game. It really did. And I'll be honest. I think the more important piece here is actually the viewership and the fan side of things. Cause let's be honest. I'll be honest. I mean, we're talking on an NBA podcast right now. I'm not watching NBA games the entire regular season. I'm just going to be honest. There's times where it's more exciting than others. What is my incentive? And I like to catch games. If I see it's like Luca versus Giannis, or you see some marquee games like that. Yeah. I like to catch those, but you know, am I watching, you know, the Raptors play the wizards on a Tuesday night? Absolutely not. I am absolutely (laughs) not. And, uh, when I saw that, the uh they were getting to the semifinals and the finals i watched both semifinals and the finals games for the nba season tournament because i was like oh i want to see what happens here and you could tell that the energy was up for the players as you already mentioned and except with the finals which i'll mention here in a second 
in the semifinals when they weren't on a neutral court, when they were actually playing in front of their home fans, you could tell just the atmosphere in the arena was electric. I mean, fans mm-hmm. were excited about it. That's one thing I think they should look to change moving forward. The championship game being in Vegas, it sounds really cool, but Vegas fans have no stake in what what's going on. So imagine if that championship game was in Indiana or it was in LA. I mean, those fans would have been going absolutely nuts and there would be an advantage to having home court in the championship game. So I think that would be kind of a cool change, but how do you determine uh, home court in that scenario? I mean, they got to work some kinks out like that. So even like, I mean, this is the first season. So yeah. Cause even when you got to um, some of the tiebreakers in the earlier knockout rounds, they were by point differential, which is really kind of like, that's weird. So you had some situations where I forget who was playing the bulls and they were up by 32 points and they were uh, following Andre Drummond with like oh, I remember that, two, yep. two minutes to go because they wanted to make sure that their point differential was good enough to uh, have a tiebreaker over other teams. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of weird. So some of the tiebreaker and some of those minor things you have to work out. But I mean, I think uh, when you look at viewership numbers, too. The average like Saturday night ABC game, which is kind of considered prime time in the NBA, averages like around two ish million people watching it. And the championship game, it was 5.6 million at its mm-hmm. peak for the championship game. So people were interested. People were, the players were into it. I think other leagues need to take note of this, honestly, whether it's the NHL, the MLB season, which is the absolute worst of the 162 <laughs> games. And I would go as far as if I was the NBA, I'd add another one coming up here too. I think it would break the season up. So you have... Uh, an in-season tournament kind of early on 20 games in then you have the all-star break which builds excitement and then you put in another tournament you know somewhere 20 games after that and then that 20 games after will lead into the playoffs so I think if you spaced out another one it could potentially Mm, add a a a lot of excitement excitement. not right before but maybe like 20 games before uh, and then after that you're, you have the 20 game stretch leading in the past. Anyway, I just think they should try to add as much excitement as possible. And I think it's possible to add another one. And I mean, it, for baseball, they could have four of them probably if they <laughs> do they one per month in baseball. But serious, I mean, other teams and other leagues need to take note. This is something that in soccer they've been doing for years internationally with wild success. So it's not a new concept. It's just new to United States sports and uh I would be shocked if the MLB and NHL didn't take note in the next few years here. Oh, yeah. Uh, you got it. All right. Next, uh, we were going to talk about there was a trade that happened. Do you know something about a trade that happened? I mean, there, wa- there, was, there was a trade. Uh, I mean, it's something to do with the Raptors and the Knicks and a kind of big first of, I feel, several deals. Uh, and probably not the only one the Raptors are going to make. Uh, we're probably looking there. Pro- I'd be shocked if come deadline, Pascal Siakam is there. I think that's kind of writing's been on the wall. But overall, I mean, you talk about the OG and Anobi trade, uh, him going to the Knicks, uh, the Raptors getting RJ Barrett and Emmanuel quickly, who I'll save for last. And I think he's the biggest winner in this trade. Uh, and it's not even close. Uh, but I, 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 a lot of people, you know, thought the Raptors fleeced them. You know, they they got R.J. Barrett, they got quickly. Uh, but if you really think about it, I mean, don't underestimate the ability that the Knicks now have to influence OG to sign long term. You give him over half a season uh, in that New York market. I mean, uh, and the Knicks are primed to to make a push. I mean, you look, I mean, you got Boston, you got Milwaukee, you got uh, Philly. But after that, I mean, the Knicks could be the fourth best team in the East and wouldn't shock me if they beat any of those teams uh, come playoff time. You look at OG Ananobi is the perfect Tom Thibodeau player 
<laughs> you think, I mean, think about it. Like, he is the perfect Tom Thibodeau player. I mean, in his first game with the Knicks, he fouled out. <laughs> I mean, but you got, I mean, granted, he, you know, I just, I mean, not great that he fouled out, but he just brought the intensity, like, right away. Uh, I think that's kind of something that the Knicks lost because you got Julius Randle, not great, not that great defensively, having a good offensive season. Uh, Jalen Brunson, not incredibly great defensively. So they got a bunch of guys that uh, you wouldn't think are great Tom Thibodeau players, but then you bring in Ananobi. I think that's I think that's really going to bring things together uh, for New York because in they do lose some depth, but you gotta think they still have Dante DiVincenzo having a great season, having a solid season. They still have Josh Hart. Uh Mitchell Robinson probably gonna trade him if he's healthy. I, I don't we'll see, but uh so they got some they got some players. Uh and then for the Raptors, I mean RJ Bear is gonna continue to get a chance can is gonna get a chance to to prove that, you know, live up to the hype, basically. Uh, I think he's going to, I don't think he really was getting a very fair shake in New York. There's just a lot of mouths to feed uh, there. And I think he was kind of being, become more of an afterthought. But he's going to get a chance to shine, especially once the Occam leaves. Uh, and you're looking at this team being built around Scotty Barnes and, uh, R.J. Barrett with Emmanuel Quickly, who he's been, I don't know if you've been looking at Quickly since he's joined the Raptors, uh, but he's starting now, he's balling, he's taking like, he's taking like five or six more attempts per game than he was with the, with the Knicks. I mean, he is, he just, he just hit, uh, 10 assists and there went over, uh, their win over the Warriors uh, the other night. So, I mean, quickly getting a chance to prove himself. Uh, again, he wasn't a guy that was, he wasn't getting a fair shake with his other team. Uh, so I, I just, I like this trade for both sides. I mean, uh, what, what, what do you think? Yeah. I mean, for NBA casual fans, I think that's who believe the Raptors fleece the Knicks. Because I was talking to somebody who doesn't watch a ton of NBA basketball, and they were saying, oh, the Raptors got such a great deal. And I was like, why do you think that? And they're like, well, look at R.J. Barrett, how many points he's averaged. I was like, yeah, but let's look at his field goal percentage and his three-point percentage. That guy has just been a product of volume. And uh, thus far, it's worked out for both teams. It's a small sample size, but the Raptors are three and one and the Knicks are four and oh. So for what it's worth, it's worked so far. But yeah, I mean, the Raptors are a young rebuilding team. They need to find pieces that are going to click around Scotty Barnes, who I don't know if Scotty Barnes is quite yet the guy you say, oh, he's going to win us a championship as our number one guy. But I mean, he's still only 22 years old and he keeps getting better and better. So there's nothing to say he won't develop into that. I see him probably being more of like a high end number two guy on a championship team. So Mm -hmm. I still think, you know, and they're going to be in a position, depending on how they finish this season, to get a top tier prospect in the draft, which could definitely Mm -hmm. make or break the future of where the Raptors end up going. But yeah, I mean, Ananobi. I mean, is an elite defensive player. You know, I don't know if you want to put him in the top 10, but I mean, I don't think it's a stretch to say he's a top 10 defensive player in the league. And that's what the Knicks bread and butter has been under Tom Thibodeau as being an elite defensive team. And just let's go, you know, I know it's a small sample size, but I was, I was curious. I said, how's this trade going for the Knicks so far? So I already mentioned they're four and oh, the teams mm-hmm. that they beat are Chicago, Washington, not impressive, but then they've beaten Minnesota. And they've beaten Philly. So -hmm. those are two very impressive wins. And I don't know if the Knicks are going to make it super far in the playoffs. But the one thing that I do know is I would not want to be matched up with them. Because you know they're going to fight for every single game in the playoffs. 
the Knicks are the kind of team that will grind out seven games every single round and somehow find themselves in the mm-hmm. finals. And, you know, offensively, Ananobi uh, is more efficient than R.J. Barrett and Emmanuel quickly have been thus far in their careers. So I think he's a good piece to have around Jalen Brunson. I still don't think they have the offensive firepower to make a serious run at Milwaukee or the Celtics, but they can win a first round series. And, yeah. you know, if they play Milwaukee or Boston in the second round, it'll be a six game series probably. Mm-hmm. So that's, uh, you know, there's they're. I don't know how far it gets them. It makes them a better team. It doesn't make them a threat in the East, in my opinion. But right, uh, no. the other thing that I want to know, so they've only, they're allowing in those four games, 100.75 points per game which is kind of ridiculous. And just for reference, the Timberwolves allow the fewest points per game this year at 107.7. So it's a full seven points lower than the current defensive uh, points per game leader. So thus far, you know, if they keep up a pace like that, they're going to be a tough team to handle. So they they can, they, like I said, I think, I think after Boston, Milwaukee, and now Philly, which I'm sure we'll talk about, uh, Late, sure we'll talk about in the coming weeks and months. Uh, behind that, behind those three, I mean, it's the Knicks can very well be that number four. I mean, sure. I mean, yeah. so and they, if they get a top, I say if they if they're a top four seed, they're winning their first round matchup. Oh, for sure. There's yeah. not a team that's not those top three that I think will be can beat the Knicks in a seven in a seven game series. Yeah, because as of right now, they'd be lined up with like the Magic or the Cavaliers. And I mean, if they got lined up with the Magic in the first round, I mean, I like what the Magic are doing. They're a young and improving team, but I think the Knicks could sweep them, honestly. (laughs) The Magic remind me a lot of OKC from a few years back. Yeah, I think that's fair for sure. All right. uh, You wanted to leave the end here open to just general thoughts on the season. So what else is on your mind so far from this season? I mean, we kind of talked about the East a little, we kind of talked about the East a little bit. Uh, Very, very interesting season. Cause we think, especially you talk about teams like the Sixers, for example, for the first time in a while, they actually, seem like they could be a threat like a real like serious threat not just be a top seed and you know suck in the first round you know and get sent home like they're like a real threat this season uh i mean i mean Embiid, tyrese maxi i mean you want to talk about a guy who's balling out right just like halliburton i mean uh I mean, he's he's been doing some things this season. Uh but then the, the West the West is what's interesting to me. The West is kind of cuz obviously you got Denver with Jokic and Jokic is going to do Jokic things just play basketball, go home, feed his horses and whatever <laughs> he does. <laughs> whatever he does off the court. Uh but I I have zero clue who can come out of the West. It could be like so many cuz you got you got to think Oh, this is the OKC is is there. Like I mean, a lot people might think it's too early. Uh but there is rumors there could be going they could be going after uh a Lori Markinen from uh, from Utah. So imagine you put you got if you got Shea, you got Chet, and you add uh, I mean they are they got a nice young rookie that uh, I think is decent and Carson Wallace. Uh, you put Lori Markinen with that squad. You do you think with Lori Markinen? Let's just assume that I'm going to assume that Josh Giddy is a part of that. Uh, part of a deal that would, you know, he'd be gone. I'd assume. Uh, do you think a a bit a three of uh, Shea, Chet, uh, and Markinen? Do you think that team? Do you think they'd be ready to compete in the Western Conference? 
No. Next question. No. No. <laughs> you're not. No, you're not I, high on. You're not high in Oklahoma City. Not right now. No. The the truth is they're not ready. That's just the reality of it. I mean, they're one of the worst defensive teams in the Western Conference right now. They're averaging the most points, but I, I don't think they're disciplined enough defensively yet to make a serious run. And we've had this conversation in the past. And I know you don't care about defense, so we're going back Set. to. Defense. Chet's been playing defense. Oh, Chet's elite defensively. Absolutely. <laughs> He's going to be the anchor of that defense for a long time. But on the perimeter, their defense is embarrassing right now. I mean, that's just the reality. So this team's not disciplined enough defensively to beat the Nuggets or the Clippers. I mean, I think it's going to be one of those two teams in the Western yeah. Conference. The Timberwolves, it's the same. I mean, I love the Timberwolves' talent. Yes. I, I, They've been some elite reason, I defensively. Just can't get behind them. I can't pinpoint. I just like. I just don't think. I mean, they're they're playing great, and they get they should get all the credit. But like, I just, I just think, I don't know if it's inexperience because you don't really, you don't really have a ton of guys on that roster that have a ton of playoff success, really. So, I mean, outside of, I mean, good. not even not even Mike Conley has a ton of success. Maybe back in the days when he had Zach Randolph or something, but it's been a while. Uh, but like, so it's like, can you, are you really buying, are we really buying Minnesota? Like, obviously Denver is probably the favorite and should be the favorite because Jokic is the best basketball player in the world right now. Uh, and the Clippers, you know, they seem, they're, they're on a little bit of a skid right now, but that's kind of partly due to Kawhi's been out. A lot recently. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so, but it seems like before Kawhi got hurt, they really got their stuff figured out with Russ coming off the bench playing like 20, 25 minutes a game and just giving that being that uh, spark plug. Uh, so if the Clippers, this to health, I just think, but I cannot trust. Kawhi and Paul George to both be healthy for a playoff run. Because if the Clippers are to be a threat, which they can be, you need Kawhi and Paul George healthy. Oh, and I, I can't I can't get behind that right now. I can't trust because Kawhi's hurt right now. He'll be fine. <laughs> I mean he'll be fine, like but you saying do you do you trust that come playoff time Kawhi and Paul George will be healthy? I oh no never. <laughs> now the biggest thing with the Timberwolves too, why I don't think they're ready is when you look at their losses this season. I wish I had this number prior to heading into this, but all their losses are against good teams. So they've been beating up on those lower tier teams. But anytime they've had a tougher game, they've lost in by a considerable amount most of the time. So that's my biggest concern. You're looking at. They're losing to Dallas and Oklahoma City. They lost to the Knicks this week. Uh, they lost to Philly not that long ago. So they're just losing to those top tier teams, which to me just says they're not quite ready yet to be that elite team. Mm-hmm. So we'll, we'll have to see. I mean, they, I, I think they're kind of kind of regress a little bit. They're clearly, I'd be shocked. If they and if they if they're even like a top three seed, uh, comes I think they're gonna be I think they're gonna fall back, and probably be somewhere in that five, the four four to seven range, uh, yeah, come that's fair. playoff time. Yeah, they're already five and five in their last ten, so they're already kind of playing down and uh, been getting much colder. So yeah, I think that's a fair statement. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I think that's it for this episode, Then, In the next episode, we're going to be going over our mid-season awards where we'll talk about MVP, Rookie of the Year, Defensive Player of the Year, Coach, Sixth Man, Finals Predictions, Most Improved, all of that fun jazz. So we will see you guys next time. Yep.